success today is no longer only defined by just how much money you make. It's blending business with social responsibility, social capital, social justice. We pair all of that um, belief into living those values. Good evening, everyone. My name is Carrie Damon. I'm the Director of Entrepreneurship Programs here at Mars. Uh, welcome to our Meet the Entrepreneur Social Innovation Session. We're very excited tonight to welcome three social innovators to talk about uh, what they're doing in the space and to give you a first-hand experience into building a social innovation venture. Uh, before I get started, I just wanted to give a shout out to our satellite centers. We have a number of partners around the province that watch our webcasts, and they've been following around, along all year, and we're very delighted to have them with us. We have NORCAT, uh, Innovation Factory, and Haltech watching. So shout out to them. Um, just in terms of a couple quick announcements before I get to the panel session. Uh, we have our Mars Future Leaders Camp is coming up in July. It's a five-day boot camp. Uh, this started a couple years ago with ages 13 to 15, and we've run up a couple successful camps, but we've had more demand than spots. So this year, we're opening it up to an additional age group of 16 to 18. It's a really fun camp. It draws on everything that we do with adult entrepreneurs around the province. So a lot of the customer development and um, early workshop experiential education that we do they have the chance to meet uh, experienced entrepreneurs and get mentorship from them. They wander around the building and interact with startups working in the building. And at the end of the week, they have a, a chance to win $1,000 in a pitch competition. Um, every year, the energy and the intelligence and the spirit of the teens really inspires everybody. If, you're, if you don't know anybody who's between 13 and 18 and, and interested in exploring entrepreneurship for a week, I recommend you come out just to see them present. You will feel very good about the future when you see them present. Okay, and um, just with that, so you might have heard on your way in that you have little stickers. So these are meant to uh, signal, signal the areas that you're interested in or you're in working in right now. So yellow is work and learning, blue is health, uh, red is government, green is energy, and I'm sure there are some that don't fit neatly into the buckets. Uh, what we wanted to do before I introduce the moderator and the panelists is just to have you um, have a few minutes to chat with the people around you. Uh, the, the presentation tonight is 90 minutes um, because we find that the panels uh, offer a lot of value and, and we generally run over time in our regular hour time slot. Um, but we're following, following the event with a reception outside. So just to get everything warmed up, if you want to take a couple minutes and just introduce yourself to those sitting around you, and if you're working on a social venture, maybe you can let them know what your value proposition is. Um, if you're just interested in this space, let them know your interest. So take a couple minutes and we'll do that. And uh, on the webcast, we hope that you have people that you can talk to as well. I hope you've had a chance to get to know your neighbors a bit more. One of the things that's great about the social innovation space, I think, is the community that's built between and among people that are passionate about social innovation. So don't be shy at the networking event and, and, and take, take this opportunity to make some connections. It's a small universe. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce our moderator, who will come up and speak a little bit about social innovation at Mars and then introduce the panel. Um, our moderator tonight is Trish Nixon. She's an associate at the Mars Center for Impact Investing, where she does a number of things for them. She does research, writing, communications, and, and other support services for the Center for Impact Investing. She also helps to run uh, Impact 8, which you might have heard of, which just is eight companies for eight weeks, and it just took in its second cohort. Um, before joining the, C, the CII team, she worked as a reporter at Thomson Reuters in Toronto and has prior experience in sponsorship marketing at RBC and the Globe and Mail. She holds a master's degree in international relations, relations from the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Trish is a member of the Executive Committee of Toronto Acumen, an official volunteer chapter of the Acumen Fund, and helps lead fundraising efforts for Peace Builders International, a Canadian charity that works to provide at-risk youth with appropriate access to justice. Welcome to Trish. Hi, everyone sort of an old bio, kind of in, in need of an update, but anyway. Um, welcome to everyone to, uh, to our panel on uh, Meet the Entrepreneurs in Social Innovation. Uh, so as, as Carrie said, I'm Trish. I work at the Center for Impact Investing, I'm running a program called Impact Aid, and also working on, uh, spending time working on, to encourage and facilitate mission investing uh, by Canadian foundations. 
Um, and so before we get started and I introduce the panelists, I'll just talk briefly about how social innovation fits in at Mars with our strategic priorities. Um, so our multiple programs and practices uh, generally fit under cultivating talent, supporting ventures, impact, and impacting systems. And all of these sit on top, of course, of our amazing platform and place. Uh, and social innovation cut, cuts across all of these themes. It's uh, increasingly integrated into all that we do at Mars. And so the Center for Impact Investing is a specific um, initiative that fits under the systems umbrella. It was founded in order to help develop a more coordinated marketplace for impact investment in Canada so that we can help bring market-based solutions to social challenges to scale. And so we do this through a number of different initiatives that fit under uh, both broad and tar targeted education, research, convening. We have uh, um, an online knowledge hub and socialfinance.ca, our blog. Um, in addition, we support pol public policy uh, and new types of product development. We connect impact ventures to capital, uh, develop new types of impact investing products, and we support ventures through programs such as Impact Date, which Carrie mentioned, and, uh, and the SVX, which is our online capital plat matching platform. And actually, uh, two, uh, two of our ventures here today are listed on the SVX, and one now uh, went through our first um, Impact Date cohort. So that's very exciting for us. Um, so now I'll, uh, I'll introduce to you our panelists. Um, we have Tal Dechiar, who co-founded MBA Without Borders, an international charity that has engaged hundreds of business professionals from around the world to volunteer and help build small, small and social businesses in more than 25 developing countries. In 2009, Tal launched the first premium footwear brand made in Africa, Oliberté Limited, which manufactures across Africa and is sold glo globally. And just last year, Oliberté's factory in Ethiopia became the world's first fair trade certified shoe factory. Tal has received far too many awards and honors to mention, but among those, he was uh, one of Canada's top 40 under 40 and Ernst & Young's Social Entrepreneur of the Year. We also have Amanda Minnick, who's the co-founder and CEO of Be Meaningful, a career site for social impact jobs. Amanda is a marketer with an MBA from the Rotman School of Business and has more than seven years of experience working in both the profit and nonprofit sectors. She's now on a mission to help professionals discover jobs with a purpose and a paycheck. And finally, we have Anil Patel, co-founder and president of Grantbook. Over the past decade, Anil has written or reviewed more than 2,500 grant proposals. He's also a serial entrepreneur, having founded the nonprofit Time Razor in 2009. And having been involved on both sides of the grant-seeking and grant-making ledger, he's currently reimagining how philanthropic information can flow so that people can solve problems. So I'd love you all to, uh, to come up to this and join me on the stage, and we can hear more about your exciting work. Okay, so uh, to start off, welcome. Thanks for being here. Um, I would love it if you could kick this off, uh, each of you, by telling us a little bit about your venture, the motivation behind founding it, um, and the problem that you're solving. So let's, uh, let's start with Grant Book and Anil. I'll give you this because okay, sure. you have yeah. some slides there to share with us. All right. So yeah, as Trish mentioned in the introduction, that over the course of a decade, I've had a chance to uh, uh, write, review, and report on 2,500 grant proposals. And maybe just by way of show of hands, anyone in the room here ever written a proposal into a government entity or a foundation looking for money to sort of, uh, so uh, yeah, about, okay, but a third, a third here. So maybe you share some of my pain and uh, joy in, in doing so. Um, so what we're, what we're trying to do is help grant makers thrive in the digital economy. So for all of us that have, say, perhaps uh, written a proposal in here, this is a, a very pained look on my face uh, for three reasons. The first, it was in Movember a couple years ago. So I'm raising money for Movember, and of course the horrible mustache on my face would prevent my nieces and nephews from coming anywhere near me. So that was unfortunate to begin with. But at the same time of trying to raise money for a charity, was also trying to raise money for the charity that I was running, but at the same time sat on a couple boards and committees that were giving money away. And so through the course of this, for any of you that have filled out a proposal that could be a few pages long or several pages long, the amount of time that it takes to submit, wait to hear back, get the funding and get work done, just realize that there's a whole gentler way that money could flow between those organizations that have it 
versus those organizations that are seeking it. So the, the real big opportunity for Grant Book is there's 90,000 grant making entities in North America, foundations of a variety of different sizes, that manage $650 billion in assets. And they're all trying to figure out how to become more digital and thoughtful in high impact granting. So that is a lot of what Grant Book does. We work with foundations of all shapes and sizes. Here's an example of us working with the Community Foundations of Canada and Ottawa. They manage, uh, through their network of 180 community foundations across the country, $3.3 billion in assets. And they're thinking about things like mission-related investments and crowdfunding and new ways to mobilize their assets and really serve the communities that they're working with. So we just tried to provide a whole bunch of new ways for them to think about uh, making work happen. And uh, so again, as Trish mentioned, uh, I wear a couple hats here. The second hat is, uh, again, founded a charity called Time Razor. We run these events across the country. And this is what really got me into this whole space over a decade ago, trying to help people connect to causes they care about. Um, so over the course of the session, I'll talk a little bit more about the Time Razor. But here, this is what I'm here to talk about. Uh, again, a, sort of a decade journey in uh, being in, in the space of, of trying to engage people to causes they care about. Great. So I think uh, we'll we'll hand it over to Amanda again. Can you oh, can you yeah. introduce uh, yourself and Be Meaningful? Absolutely. So hi, I'm Amanda, co-founder of Be Meaningful, which is a really niche uh, career site that's dedicated to helping professionals find jobs with a purpose and a paycheck. And it's the inspiration for for the site really came from a personal uh, motivation. Uh, I've always loved marketing. And after I graduated, I worked for a, as a marketing for a real estate company, and I went back to do my MBA. And in between my first and second year, I thought I got my dream job as a marketing intern uh, at Kraft. I was on the kids' salty snack brand. I was like, awesome, I love snacks, I love kids, this is perfect. <laughs> and at the end of the summer, I kind of realized that it wasn't my dream job, and it wasn't because I gained like five pounds eating all the salty snacks, but it was because of something I learned about myself. And I remember the time we were, I was on Ritz Bits as one of the brands in the portfolio, and we were, you know, talking about what was gonna be the next innovation from the States. And they're like, how about a giant Ritz Bit sandwich? And I just remember thinking to myself, that is so dumb. And <laughs> it's like so unhealthy, and why would people wanna buy it? And they just had like this ad, like a family going on a picnic and eating like this giant Ritz Bit sandwich. And it was sort of at that moment that I realized for me personally, it was more important to believe in the mission or the purpose of the organization or the brand that I'm working on than just sort of selling one more cracker. And after I graduated, I got a job um, doing marketing for a global NGO. And it was there that I kind of discovered that there's sort of this hidden career market where you can use your marketing skills but for sort of a good cause. And there's lots of companies and causes that allow you to do that. And I just, I had no idea about it. They don't talk about it in business school. And, um, you know, when I was looking for my next step in my career, I knew I didn't need to stay a nonprofit, but I found it very confusing. All the companies had different names for um, their, their jobs. They had different titles. You, you, There's a lot of buzzwords out there. And so I've, we kind of, in the entrepreneur in me, figured there had to be an easier way. And so that sort of helped inspire, um, be meaningful, and, and the sort of three categories that we have in terms of like corporate social responsibility, nonprofit, and social good, and just sort of a one place that could be that career destination uh, for that. And the other you know, challenge that I found was that you, know, you don't know what you don't know. So you don't even know what your career options are. You don't even know what companies like Oliverter Grant Book that you could work for that allow you to use your skills but for a good cause. And so what we try to do is we profile professionals doing these meaningful jobs and uh, give you kind of that inside scoop um, of going behind the scenes and letting people know what it's actually like to work at an organization and really break those myths about working at a nonprofit, you're just volunteering. And, and uh, yeah, so that's me and my journey. Thanks, Amanda. I think I could have used that back when I was 
looking for what I eventually found here at, at Mars, of course, in the Center for Impact Investing. But there's a lot there that I think, uh, in terms of trends we're seeing with, with the young people and, and job seekers today that we'll, we'll touch on. But first, I will uh, I'll let Tal tell you a little bit of Au Liberté. In a nutshell, there's two things I love. There's a lot of things I love. But in terms of my professional, it's blending business with, I guess, what today is called social responsibility, social capital, social justice. And kind of along my journey, I'm 33 years old, so relatively young, relatively old. It's all about perspective. Uh, I've always been trying to figure out how to match and how to find the right place for all of those experiences that I've had. So come from an immigrant family. Mother was born in Latvia. My dad was born in Ukraine. I was born in Israel. Family moved to Canada. And the joke for a long time in our family was the only one who was really Canadian was our dog. <laughs> and, and that's what it was. And while it was always kind of a funny matter for us, for anyone here who's an immigrant, it is so hard for a true immigrant. I'm not saying immigrant from Canada to the US, but an immigrant who doesn't speak the language, doesn't know the culture, to adapt. And we say we're you know, these great countries and there's all these opportunities, but we have amazing doctors and lawyers from you know, Syria or India who are you know, driving, nothing wrong with driving a taxi, but are driving taxis or doing jobs that they just couldn't manage. And so my parents had that same struggle, brilliant engineers from the former Soviet Union, and they somehow had to figure it out. Dad worked at pawn shops. My mom was the breadwinner for a while. Some of you may know the company de Havilland. She helped build parts of the wings. Anyway, they saved up some money. Eventually, they started a furniture store, turned into five. They kind of built up a great company that's done very well for them, for their family, and all the 50 employees that they hired and employed over those years. And so I saw firsthand, wow, that's pretty cool. Somebody who knew nothing about business, had really no reason to be in business, created jobs and opportunities for themselves and for so many other people. And then I went and did, you know, traveled around the world. Instead of going to Europe where a lot of my friends or colleagues went, I went only where I had money. And so I'd go to Belize and build tree nurseries in Central America. And I sold sandwiches on the beach in Chile. I had a radio show in Singapore. And I had all these great experiences. And I just kept going and going and going and going and going. And then I did an MBA because I thought that was something I'd be interested in. Not because I want to be a, a run a corporation, but purely I just love business and I want to learn. Created an NGO out of that called MBAs Without Borders, where that's where the purpose was. How do we bring people with business professionals into the developing world to create unique, sustainable business solutions? I know nothing, and I don't really care about the word social entrepreneur or social entrepreneurship. So I said, how do we do that? And so what we did is we created amazing companies and helped great non nonprofits in 25 countries. And in a unique transaction, because you can't own a charity, I personally own the rights of that charity. And I sold that to a charity that was started by Condoleezza Rice, uh, the former Secretary of State in the United States, uh, she, to the, when she first started it. The reason I tell you that story is everything was kind of going in the trajectory of, I'm doing good, I feel good about myself. But I was always stuck with the point that it wasn't good enough. And the reason it wasn't good enough is, in my opinion, traditional aid, with respect, doesn't have really a role in the development of economies. When we, need, when we have disasters, we have, when we have healthcare crises and education, you need aid. But in developing an economy, specifically in Africa, over a trillion dollars has been spent in sub-Saharan Africa, and more countries are worse off on that continent today than they were back then. And what's the solution? I believe it's commerce. I believe it's export. I believe it's import. And so I love the idea of how to balance all those things. And so I'll talk about it a little bit later on. And I didn't barely have even talked about Au Liberté, but that's how the idea came, is how can I create real change that creates real commerce, that creates a taxable income base for the local governments that can change the potentially the way we all look at Africa from a manufacturing base and from a business base. And that's what drives me every day, in addition to my family motivations. And that's how we got to Au Liberté. And Tal, that actually brings me to a question uh, that, I, that I wanted to bring up. So maybe I'll, I'll start with you. But um, in conversations with customers, with investors, with partners, how do you balance that uh, social mission with the business case? Au Liberté is a, a business, clearly. It's, uh, you know, um, it's not a charity. You're making real money. Um, but there's a clear social mission baked in. And so do you lead with that? Do you lead with the business case? Can you talk a bit about that balance? Yeah, so it's, it's a great question. Um, I would love it if everybody cared about the social mission of our company. Nine, that's not true. 85% of people don't. That's the truth, right? There's this thing called the low-hass market, people that are interested in life, health, and sustainability. They say in the US and Canada, that's 15 to 22% of the market. In Japan, it's 35% of the market. That's who our core demographic is. In our specific case, between 20 to 45, and then we have some outliers. But the majority of people don't give a crap about all this social stuff. And so at the end of the day, if our shoes cannot sell on their own, 
nothing here matters. The reason I started it is because I wanted to create the most responsible footwear brand in the world made and rooted in sub-Saharan Africa. We own our own factory. We have now over 100 workers in the factory. We're the first fair trade certified factory. We're a B Corp. We're part of 1% for the planet. We do all these things that every tree hugger loves, but none of it matters if we can't sell shoes. And to be honest, our investors, while they love that aspect, they're really not. When, we finally, when I finally accepted the fact that I could not ask an investor to accept a lower return than they normally would get in any other business, that's when we started to really raise serious capital. We've, not, we're not a big company, but we've raised about three and a half million dollars in capital to date. And I would say all of them have that social aspect in their heart, but none of them invested in us because they believe first and foremost in the social aspect. Our customers, 20% buy us because of the social aspect, but 100% of our customers now buy us because they love the shoes, they love the quality, and all that extra stuff, it's not the first part, but it's the value add. Don't lead with it, but make it additional reasons. If I show you a shoe today and tell you, hey, would you like this boot for $140? You're like, screw that, I don't wanna spend $140. But if I tell you how it's made, how many people made it, why it's made, that it's fair trade certified, why fair trade certified matters, how we treat the leather, how we take care of the animals, why we do everything we do, you forget to ask yourself, oh wait, how much is that shoe? You just buy it anyway. It's not always the case, but that's usually what we go on. So sell the, it's a sell, sell the sizzle, sell the steak. It goes just as much in social entrepreneurship. Thanks. And I know this is um, uh, on, on a similar subject. This is your, your grant book is your second social venture or more, de <laughs> depending on, on the ones that you count. Um, but can you, grant book, or Time Razor was a nonprofit. Um, mm -hmm. You decided to incorporate that way. Uh, grant book is a for profit, although it's working, it's heavily tied to the philanthropic sector. Can you talk a bit about uh, the common threads, the differences, the decision to incorporate uh, grant book as a for profit? and how you're incorporating your, or maintaining the social mission? Yeah, I think the um, experience of after 10 years of running a charity, despite the fact that we did very well in terms of raising the resources that we need to support the program, that we weren't able to take um, some of that success to the bank and be and say, we have, we have needs for a line of credit, we need uh, or, or, or a loan. And we didn't have any of access to the financial instruments to actually grow to scale our venture. Everything continued to be, despite some of the revenue generating stuff, very traditional grants and, and uh, uh, writing to foundations. So the decision to go to grant book is it's based on a very compelling business model. It's based on a very, very well-defined value proposition and problem statement. But just recognizing a little bit, you know, 10 years after the fact, a little bit wiser that just the access to capital and what people would respond to, to make it really sustaining was probably the biggest decision. So it was, it was access to you know, multitudes of scale, larger um, access to capital, and just the types of conversations that we could be proactive in around how we were building our financing versus always, always being on the defensive in the, other, uh, 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 in the charitable space. As a for instance, we would have over a million and a half dollars of contract signed um, either by government or through very reputable foundations. We couldn't take that to the bank and say, this, here's the schedule payment that will get money from these foundations. However, we just need like six months to sort of flow through. There, there wasn't anyone in the space um, who would allow that to happen. And in the for-profit space, you know, that's just the way business is done. So again, part of that is I'm just like, after 10 years of, of excruciating pain and just trying to manage cash flow for anyone who's had to manage cash flow and meeting payroll and doing all those sorts of things, um, you, you have to go where the sustainability is and there just seems to be a little bit more of that long-term, uh, 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 I guess, accessibility. I'm going the for-profit route with a very clear social purpose mission than going through the charitable route. Okay, thanks. And Amanda, I'd love to hear from you on, on this same subject. Um, uh, be meaningful, obviously, uh, huge social component there. Uh, seems to be the reason, from the way you talk about it, the reason you started it. Uh, uh, be Meaningful is probably the, well, is the earliest stage venture um, of, of the three we're here to talk about today. Can you talk about how you're going to incorporate, how you're going to make sure that uh, your, your core motivation uh, is embedded within your company? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, as, as you mentioned, I mean, and as I talked about, uh, impact is really at the core of what we do. Um, and it's, it, it sort of drives the mission. And as Tal mentioned, though, you know, you got to win, though, the business on, um, on having a good product and, and not just because it's about purpose. And I think, though, to be a really successful entrepreneur today that, you know, you, you may not 
win just because you have some social innovation embedded, but if you don't have it, I don't think that you'll be a successful entrepreneur in the long run. Um, in terms of the question about how you know, we plan on, on staying on track, you know, we, we think about impact all the time, and since you know, it's important for us to live and sort of breathe the values that we espouse to companies, part of our conversation is you know, we want to become a B Corp. Uh, we talk about you know what causes we want to support. You know, currently we we support uh, Dress for Success. It's a nonprofit that sort of is in the same um, sphere of helping women um, in in the job market. Um, but it's it's also thinking about um, we're not going to take every job that and goes on our site. So it's really important for us to have those conversations that um, are difficult, like. Um, what companies, you know, won't be allowed. You know, there's, I think there's a lot of black and white in terms of, you know, we'd love, you know, for these types of jobs to be on our site, but what happens if, a, you know, a CSR position opens up at a tobacco company? Or what happens, you know, that's pretty, that's our non-negotiable. But then the conversation gets a little bit more challenging when, okay, what about a mining company? Or an oil company? Or alcohol and gaming? And it, it gets very, gray and fuzzy and so you know we plan are already having those conversations uh, me and my partner and then also relying on the community of people who are part of our network and the B Corp community as well as they've you know got established systems already in place to how to sort of define what is a, it was a good company but it's it's definitely since it's such a new sort of sector it's still very um, undefined and it's a process. I'm just going to pause there for one second. Does everybody know what a B Corp is? Yes, no, I see some head shaking. We have, we have, two, we have two B Corp, uh, certified B Corps in the audience and a third who, uh, who plans to become. Do one of you guys want to talk about what a B Corp is and your decision to, to get that certification? In its simplest form, it means that you as a company adhere to both profitable and social matters. Obviously, as a business, you're profitable and that's your, that's your purpose. Uh, but in your articles of incorporation, the kind of the real statute of what you do as a business, most articles of incorporation are about profitability. Where B Corp, the big change is you have to change your articles of incorporation so that in the event of a acquisition, a merger, whatever changes over time, cha changes in shareholdership, that your laws basically dictate that the board of directors and the owners have to always consider social matters as well as profitable matters in making every kind of key decision in a nutshell. Yeah, and, and the application progress, uh, process is rather rigorous. So there's five major criteria, such as governance and the way that you do hiring or environmental considerations if you're more on the manufacturing side. So it's quite detailed and extensive and uh, does require a lot of thought before you actually go to your lawyers and say, we'd like to make these amendments to your uh, uh, articles of corporation. And you can, uh, you can see on, on Anil's title slide, uh, he has the B Corp certification logo up there. So whenever you're, you're shopping or looking at products or companies, you can look out for, for that logo and support businesses who do good by doing well. Doing well by doing good. One of the two. <laughs> um, so, uh, so Tal, um, Oliberté has, uh, has been around the longest of any of these companies. Uh, you've uh, raised uh, um, some capital, um, constantly growing and scaling up. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, where you're at now and um, and some of the unexpected challenges you've faced in growing and growing and developing your business? So Oliberté started technically in February 2009, uh, but we really hit the shelves really in yeah February 2009. So kind of at the height of the Great Recession, uh, first core season was really September of 09. But retail took a big hit. I mean, of all the industries, and mom and pop shops, I mean, they got beat up pretty hard a couple years ago. Uh, so the fact that we went into footwear, I knew nothing about shoes. Uh, we were making our shoes in Africa, which already was unheard of, at least in the way that we were doing it and the scale we were doing it. And the big kicker is we had no money. I mean, sure, I ran MBAs without borders, and that was great. And we had all these, I don't know, we had a couple billionaires, but we had some very well-off individuals supporting our organization. But when the Great Recession hit, I mean, nobody could help us. I mean, it was just, it was, it was too tough for, with even my, with my network. And I didn't know what to do. So I, I basically, that's why I talk about my parents. I mean, they came to this country in their late 30s, early 40s. They had nothing and they figured it out. So I basically looked at my wife, who 
lets me be Peter Pan every day. And I said, look, we're, I'm 27, 28. Worst case, in 10 years from now, I'm bankrupt. I'll be 38. My parents weren't even in this country, and they had nothing to their name before they figured it out. What's the worst thing that happens? I have an education. I live in a great country. I'll figure it out. And so we bankrolled it all. We put up the house, maxed every line of credit. And I basically said, ah, I do this for a year. Everybody's going to come on board. It'll be no problem, right? Did it for a year, did it for two years. Nobody still wanted to touch us. I did Dragon's Den, did it twice. I mean, second time was a different reason. Um, and I mean, Dragon's Den was more marketing than raising capital. But I've talked to probably close to 175 different angel groups, investors, private equity funds, you name it. And it's been, that's been the biggest challenge of raising a for-profit or, or a social business, is raising capital in a market, in my business, where we're growing 100% per year, but we got to build inventory. And now we own our own factory. And our customers want to pay us 100 days after we ship. So just to give you a real life example, right now is May 1st, April, let's say April 15th. I am paying right now for raw materials that I will not get paid back from. I will only deliver to Zappos and Amazon and Nordstrom in let's say October, November, and they'll pay 90 days after. So I'm gonna get paid in March on stuff that I have to pay for today. That's a lot of cash that you need to make that work. And so the only way I could make that work was going to banks. Unfortunately, banks didn't wanna to touch me. And so I always believe, whenever I hear someone say, but you had a house, you had this, you had that, if you want money, there's money to be found. The question is how much are you gonna pay? And so I found lenders that charged me 42% interest a year, and my margins were strong enough and my business was solid enough that I knew I could weather that storm. And then eventually we got stronger and then I raised, and then I got close to a million dollars in debt at 24% a year. And everyone's like, oh my God, that's ridiculous. I'm like, what do you mean? It's half of what I paid before. <laughs> but we kept going. And that was the key is if you want money, it's out there. The question is how much are you willing to pay for and how much are you willing to risk financially? And some of you can do it, some of you can't, but that's what got us through everything is that we kept finding ways to raise money, even as expensive as it was. And then now we have investors and we've raised money on top of that. But that was the biggest challenge. No matter the, con the concept, what we did, it's how do you find that money? And grants, I'm not a big fan of government grants or CEDA or those programs. There's too much red tape, too much paperwork. I got to run a business. I don't have time to chase paperwork. And I'm trying to develop jobs and economies and it just doesn't happen. So I got to find the most liquid cash I can and sometimes that's the most expensive. And that's probably going to be a lot of your experiences down the road as things grow or your credit checks aren't great or whatever it might be. But that's how you find, how, that's how we built it is we, we risked it all and we paid a lot for it and now we're luckily, we're luckily the ones who are trying to get bought out by some of the biggest shoe companies in the world today because of it. So, so obviously um, not those early lenders, um, but, but when you're talking to investors now, um, do you find that there are uh, those that really understand and believe in the, your social value proposition, if you will. Like, are there are there impact investors yeah, 100%, out there? Yeah, 100%. 100% there are. Um, and some of them know what they're doing and some of them don't, just like regular investors. And that's the thing. That's the hardest thing in this job. As much as we've been turned down by money, it's when somebody has a check in front of you for a million dollars and you know they're not the right investor for you. You know, we've had investors that came to us and literally would have written us a check tomorrow for a million dollars but we know all they wanted with us was the African lifestyle, and they would probably ship us over to China tomorrow. And that's not what, nothing wrong with making shoes in China, actually, but that's just not what our mission's about. But then on the mission side, there were some really great people that probably want us to hug too many trees, because you have to make sure you're not too left and too right. Because I, I watch a lot of social businesses that want to give money to this charity, and we're going to donate to this, and we're going to donate to that. I'm like, why are you donating all that money? You're not even profitable yet. It doesn't make any sense. And then you have to start telling these charities, sorry, I can't give you the money this year. I can't do these programs this year. Never offer something that you can't guarantee you're going to keep paying back. And so that's the best advice I give for some, one of the best for these social businesses. And that's what these investors respect from us, is that we're trying to be a business that happens to have a social impact, not a social business that happens to be a business. And now, what do you think? I know uh, Grant Book is uh, a little newer, has raised uh, some capital uh, and bootstrapped and, and grown through revenues as well. Um, uh, what type of capital are you looking for? Are you, are you going for impact investment or you know, looking within the philanthropic community that you're working with? Can you speak a bit to that? Yeah, sure. We um, raised a little bit of money through the Ontario Catapult um, program, and that sort of just helped with a little bit of uh, bootstrapping that we needed at the time. And uh, now that we're moving from a very traditional sort of consultancy model more into a managed services, so again, the Lean Canvas, if you're familiar with that, 
whole process, which we've had to go through many, many iterations of, is really sort of uh, uh, getting the interest of a lot of potential investors. So all of that to sort of say, we're literally in the, mix, uh, in, in the next few weeks to sort of go to a whole bunch of angel networks who all have expressed sort of interest if we're able to make this sort of a nice little pivot. And uh, so uh, we're considering our options, whether it's just some loan financing to help us sort of make that transition, because it will be a little bit expensive, or do we go and actually do some equity type of stuff? And there are foundations and other groups that are doing things like mission-related investments, taking some of the $650 billion in assets that I mentioned, and actually uh, put that into the marketplace. So there's some, some really interesting things that are opening up between traditional um, um, banking, finance, and the nonprofit charitable space, especially foundations that control so much in assets. And so we're right in the middle uh, of that whole process. But what I will add in, again, a little leading with a little bit of, you, you really have to live the values that you're promoting. And at least in our particular case, when we say that we want to help groups th thrive in the digital economy, we pair all of that um, belief into living those values. And what I mean by that, we have a, a, a password protected uh, web portal that has our entire business model tied to all of our financials. And if there ever was an investor who was really interested in seeing what type of um, net value we're generating for our clients or what does our cash flow look like, what does our balance sheet, we can sort of provide that within five clicks in 50 seconds. And so it just frees up. We're not spending a whole bunch of time reproducing financials. We're not spending a whole bunch of time talking about you know the research that we've done or the competitive mix and all this sort of stuff that gets in the way of just getting the work done. And, and so by mirroring, um, again, the very experience that we want to sort of share with the clients, it's that whole reason to believe. Like if we can walk the talk, then it's easy to sort of show how we can move that forward with the people we work with. So I have to, you know, in terms of raising the money, coming back to really showing the proofs in the pudding, like showing that you live the values becomes really, really important. Because again, it gives people who are very, very busy and have lots of opportunities to um, make different types of decisions, um, you have to stand out and you have to be able to sort of show why you over some other venture. Thanks. Um, so Amanda, Be Meaningful is, is a little earlier stage and I don't believe has even start, started to raise capital um, yet, but I'd love to hear a bit about your, your experience so far. Um, can you tell us about some of the key hurdles that you've faced um, and also some of the key supports for entrepreneurs, uh, social entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs in general uh, in, within this ecosystem? Sure, yeah, it's a, it's a rich question. So um, we're definitely more on the, the baby side compared to these ventures and sort of the, in the infancy phase, but it's really exciting. I think every Every, once you sort of become an entrepreneur, it's about sort of enjoying every moment in that process and really feeling um, excited by it and seeing where you can where you can go. Um, we're about, I'd say, uh, six months old, or we started. We kind of got a site up in the end of the summer. Um, our strategy the whole time though has been always to bootstrap. Me and my business partner were both working full time, um, other jobs, and we just wanted to get something up and sort of have that proof of concept. And over the last, or I guess since the summer, we've been doing that and talking to people and we've learned a lot along the way. And so right now we um, in, are investing in, in building a new website that's more custom, that's more dynamic, kind of shows off a little bit more of our personality. That purple sheep that you saw um, up front, um, that's sort of a little bit of our, our mascot and really sort of build that brand. And so our biggest challenge though, I have to say, is just finding the right technical partner. Um, both me and my business partner, we met in business school actually. Um, so we kind of got that side figured out, but I didn't realize how hard it would be to find um, just someone to actually like build and do that, the development and the design. And it's just, um, even just within my own networks, it was difficult and we've already been through one uh, designer developer that is a story for another time, but it's definitely a lesson along the way, and they just had some designs that I was like, you know, I think I can do this better. And so I went, there's these online courses, uh, taking the girl's guide to graphic design, and I'm learning how to do Photoshop, which is maybe not the best use of my time, but it's something that uh, I, I do love to do, and that I, it can help sort of take, you know, I'm sure if you, you're working on something, you have a vision for it that someone else, it's really hard to explain to someone else to, to say to do, and you don't want to be standing over the shoulder being like, move that to the left just a little bit. 
And so um, for our new site, we'll all be doing the designs. And we've been fortunate to find sort of a good third party developer to help build the site. But we'd really love to bring that in house. Um, and so that's still been something that we're that's been of a challenge. And the other thing is sort of, I think Tal sort of touched on it, but just how long everything takes. Like you think in your head, okay, you know, by this amount of months, like you'll be at a certain point, but just really just, you know, I guess the phrase Rome wasn't built in a day is, has lasted around for so long for a reason, because it's so true that it, everything does take a lot more time than you think. In terms of the resources, I mean, Mars is a fantastic resource, which is why we're all here today, um, especially in terms of the social innovation space and the just has their finger on the pulse of what's happening and who's doing what. So it's a great place to get ideas and just to meet with people. And then um, just I think there's a lot of just startup things happening in the city. One of the conferences that I went to last year that I really enjoyed was the Socialite Conference. Um, it's kind of like a TED Talk meets Oprah meets um, just another random conference where uh, all the speeches, they have like sort of the TED style format, but they're all supposed to be like inspirational. It's great, um, a lot of networking stuff. And Tyler and Il, uh, are there any sort of key resources, supports, anything that really helped you out uh, at any stage um, along the way? Um, yeah, there was, um, I, again, this sort of goes back about 10 years ago, but it was just a very helpful, um, spent sort of six months uh, doing research to get the time raiser off the ground, six months of doing some consultations, and then six months building the plan. But, and I went to a whole bunch of people and just started asking questions. What do you think of the model? What do you think of the model? And um, there, there's one gentleman in particular who um, said, either you're going to be part of the problem or part of the solution, and that really stuck with me as always checking your assumptions at the door and always thinking about what's next and always um, trying to always build a better question on top of the initial question um, that you started with. And, and if, you, if you continue um, uh, the self-discovery about how, how do we make this better or, or talk to other people about what they're doing and again, framing everything rather than you having the answer, the power of the question um, has just, and, and so all of my subsequent sort of meetings and ventures and everything else have always sort of followed, you know, it's always better to have a better question than a better answer, uh, or what you think to be a good answer. And it's really amazing how people will engage with you and share insights and networks and contacts. And, and so, so that particular um, stumbling across that one conversation that led to this uh, way of thinking is, has been helpful to my team in, in how we approach our work. That sounds like um, a great culture for innovation. Yeah. <laughs> the base for uh, Tal. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's along the same lines that Anil said. I mean, for me, it's kind of self, what I call kind of, not a call, some, um, it's self-mentorship, right? So I hate schmoozing to schmooze. I don't like networking events. If an event says, come, it's a great networking event, I usually don't go. It's, just, it's not me. I don't enjoy that, that aspect of, I'm a type A sales personality, but it's just not me. But if there's a genuine thing you're trying to get out of something, I love embracing people that want to share, share information. So I've been really lucky that People love to share information, and I think I'm getting better. I'm not great, but getting better at taking that in. And so, you know, I get I get to meet with Harry Rosen or Danny Reese, who runs Canada Goose, or the owners of Timberland. And I'm a nobody, but just because I'm doing something neat and I'm open to asking questions, they love to tell me and they come on by any time. And I do. I take them up on that. And that's probably has been the best education outside of the number two, which is I'm not. Everyone on our staff laughs like I suck at grammar, and even though I'm an MBA and I have all these things, I should be really good at it. But I auto text more than I even actually r write text, and it always comes up gar garbage or garbled. But <laughs> what I love to do, and I do in any free time I have on all the planes that I'm on, it's read, and I read a lot. Anything to do about business or social or social analytics. So, like today, right now, right now at this period, and I read it a few times. But I read Eve Schwinnard's book, which is "Let My People Go Surfing." Eve Schwinnard, for those that don't know, is the founder of Patagonia. Great business and blends business and social. You know, I'm reading Gary Vaynerchuk, who swears every third word, but built Wine Library and probably is, in my opinion, the king on social media and how to run a business, whether nonprofit or for profit. And I just picked up the new Pixar book, which is about creativity. Just anything to do about business, that for me is my brain candy. And I just read and read and read and read. And I learned that listening to Warren Buffett. Apparently, Warren Buffett reads 10,000 pages a week. And I love that. I mean, and so I, I don't have enough time, but that's, those are the two things I try to embrace, both kind of 
my personal mentorship network and then reading business or things that I'm interested in. I don't read a lot of fiction. My wife makes me watch a lot of crap on TV that I don't want to watch, and that's where I get my garbage. But other than that, I try to get the rest where I can get it. We'll have to get you to, uh, to write us a, a key reading list. Yeah, post I'll, I'll post it on socialfinance.ca or something. For sure. <laughs> um, we're, we're about halfway through, and I'd really love to take uh, an opportunity to invite any questions from the audience. I have some more questions for these guys, but uh, I'm sure that some things have come up you might want to know more about. Does anybody want to come up to the mic and ask a question of any of the panelists? Thank you to the panelists. Uh, this has been great so far. Questions to tell. And thank you for saying that you love to read because I have to ask this, because as you're going about describing how you got to Canada and the idea, I have to wonder, did you ever read about the story of another immigrant couple that came to Canada and wanted to build a company around shoes, namely the Battas? And they got into Africa and they got into manufacturing and retail. And I'm, there have been good things and bad things. So I'm wondering, one, did you actually read anything about them? And two, has there been anything good, bad, ugly, or indifferent that you got out of their story going into founding your company? So it's a sensitive subject somewhat. Um, only in terms of I have a lot of respect, though I never met Thomas Bada. I have a lot of respect for Thomas Bada. Thomas Bada is the founder of, of Bada. Uh, Sonia is his wife who kind of runs their charitable giving right now. He was the, he was, there's the story, you know, Thomas Bada and his head sales rep are in Africa and the, the head sales rep says, what a waste of time, nobody here wears shoes. And Thomas says, wow, what an opportunity, nobody wears shoes, right? <laughs> and and uh, I haven't read the book, but I know the story very well, um, obviously because being a Canadian company working in Africa, uh, without getting too political, unfortunately, uh, when Thomas uh, passed and kind of sent it on to the next generation, the next generation made a silly mistake and thought there was no market in Africa. And actually, they, BAT has taken everything out of Africa except for one retail shop uh, in Kenya, which is really Indian imports out of their India, uh, India BATA shop. And so I'm pretty disappointed. They, really, they were the ones there before me. I'm not the first, but I'm the first to do it for export. Um, but I, I look at a lot of what they're doing from a model point of view. I would have loved to met Thomas and kind of interacted with him. Not so interested in meeting his sons, um, but uh, <laughs> but that's just me being candid. I think there's another question here. If yeah, if you can come up to the mic, and anybody else who who wants to step up, uh, feel free. Um, this question is also for Artel. Um, I really admire your story. Kind of echoes with my own. Um, you mentioned that you know you really stretch your credit and took on interest. Um, of 42 uh, percent. What made you do that? I mean, shouldn't your profit cover uh, your your interest after tax saving? But you're at the same time a social entrepreneur. Um, how do you find that sweet pricing point? And have you ever thought about reducing your account receivable turnover from 90 days down? Is it because Amazon has too much bargaining power? I'm not sure if this is too much question to no, answer. No, it's, it's a great question, um, and I think. Uh, Anil might have some of the same, um, and, and I don't want to speak for Anil because I don't really know much about him or his business, but the social space is very much in some way similar to the tech industry in terms of people are seeing this as maybe the next phase of tech, right? The valuations are a little bit higher than maybe what they should be. They're going at a pace that, uh, that could potentially have some really great growth if it is truly scalable. Um, and so if a lot of social businesses, and I'm not saying this about Anil's business, I'm saying this about mine, this particular part, actually aren't profitable for the first couple of years. We will only be profitable this year. I mean, we lost last year $400,000, the year before that 300, before that 300, and, and a little bit more before that. So we're now at a phase that, you know, the high interest doesn't help. I mean, last year, I'll give you our numbers. I, uh, we're, not a big, not, we're not a big company. We did 20 grand our first year in business, then we did 220, then we did 460. Uh, last year we did a million two, and we'll do a little over 2.4 this year. But, um, but in those numbers, last year, I, sorry, last year I did 1.2, I paid $210,000 just in interest. Imagine what I could have done with that money, right? But it kept me in business. And if I never spent that $200,000, I probably would have closed up shop because I couldn't run my cash flow. Uh, with Amazon, they're not actually that big of a customer. We have other big customers. 
unfortunately, they're the players in the game where we're able, as a business, and if you have your own, if I was to do this again from day one, if I could figure out and I had enough money, I would, and don't get me wrong, we sell the town shoes, we're selling soon to Atmosphere through Forzani Group, great retailers, but I would never sell to a retailer ever. If I really had enough money, can do my own business, I would only sell direct to consumer, 100%. You get your cash right away, you know your customer, you get, to, you get to create your story, you take out the middleman. My shoe, like the shoe I'm wearing, any shoe on our site on average, costs $30. That's what it costs. We then pay, charge about $60 to Amazon or Nordstrom. I mean, that's typically how the Keystone works. And then to a retailer, we'll charge to you as a customer, you'll pay $140, right? If I would have gone direct to consumer, potentially, it's what Warby Parker, if you don't know, that's kind of what they did with glasses. They went direct. You could bring down the cost of an item, sell it direct. Where the problem somebody like Warby Parker is having is they don't have enough money. Warby Parker just raised $30 million because they have to build so much inventory to manage that growth plus marketing. And so there's goods and bads, a little long-winded, but I don't have control to tell some of our retailers you can't pay 90 days until we're the it brand. And suddenly we're the brand that everybody needs. I get to do whatever I want. But then as soon as we're not the it brand, they're going to throw us out the door. And that's where we're trying to be careful. We never want to become a fad. That's why if you look at our styles, they're very conservative in terms of they follow men's fashions. Men are dumb shoppers. They just want brown and black, <laughs> loafers and boots. They know nothing about what they're buying, right? Women are so difficult, but that's the market. And now that's the market we're heading in because we got really good at men's footwear. Uh, but you have to balance that. So it kind of does and doesn't and answer your question, but that's the best yeah, I can yeah, do. Yeah, pretty much. Thank you. And the reason I brought up Anil is maybe from a, he's more the tech and that's such a cool kind of tech. Yeah, I think I actually have our annual profit in my pocket. Uh, <laughs> so at that th $3. So but it's we're more not, than we're not, us, we're right? not running. We're not running but in that, the red. But, but that's the thing. As much as he's making fun of that, he's more profitable than Amazon, right? Like he is. I mean, I think Amazon, I don't know, maybe now they're profitable. No, I think they showed a negative return. He's more profitable than Tesla. Like it's such an inflated market out there that if you can just be a little bit profitable, you actually are doing better than some. So congrats on that. Thanks. On that quickly, um, I know. Uh, Grant Book has been, yeah, really great at, at mm -hmm. uh, you know, earning revenue right away, almost from, from you know, inception. Um, can you talk about why you are looking to raise capital at this stage rather than just continue to bootstrap? Yeah, a good portion of, because um, again, our, our business model is, is in many ways very sort of uh, unsexy. We help uh, bring a series of technology solutions. It's very much like the 3M model. We don't make products, we make existing products better. And the way that 3M was able to make existing products way better and make it profitable is they had to pour a whole bunch of money into research and development. Research and development can take a lot of time. There's always mistakes. You need the right team. And so for all of those reasons, as we move from our existing business line, which again has been showing very good growth in terms of revenue and the $3 in profit that I showed you in terms of uh, operating profit, um, to make that switch into where we really want to be will require money. And so the decision about, again, how we access funding to build the 3M style. Um, we want to take existing products, make that way better, build some analytics on top, which is where sort of in the tech space where a lot of money is. That's what's forcing us to sort of think about this as opposed to just continuing the status quo. Great. And there's, an, there's another audience question here. Hi. Um, so my question's for Amanda. Um, I have a similar background to you. I actually came from the CPG world and I'm doing my MBA at Rotman right now. Um, and because you're a newer company, um, I'm just wondering how you kind of went to market, like how you managed it all. Um, I'm not sure when you graduated from the program, but like what I'm grappling with right now is I was working full time and doing the MBA and have this like social innovation idea that I'm trying to kind of bring to life. And I'm just wondering for you, um, you mentioned that you were working full time when you started your, your project. So what was kind of the breaking point for you when you realized, okay, I have to follow my passion, like this other stuff is gonna have to take a back burner? Yeah, no, great question. And I think it's something that a lot of people struggle with as well. Um, I graduated Rotman in 2009 and at the height of the, the best time to graduate from any business program, right when the, the markets decide to to go down, but um, I, when I was working sort of at, at uh, where I was, at Right to Play, um, it was nearly like four years, and kind of around the time that I started thinking about my next step, and that's sort of when I kind of came up with the idea, I started just working on it. And um, the, both these guys mentioned, you know, talking to people and just 
um, getting, you know, just bouncing the ideas and a if you're asking the right questions. And so once I started doing that, I kind of started sort of unofficially working on it. And then um, in terms of, you know, the breaking point, I think it was just, once you get to a point where you feel like you know you're working um, you know nine more than nine to five on sort of your sort of what you call your day job and then you immediately turn off and then you you're thinking about the business all the time and you know I, this is being webcasts but don't sort of keep it between us that you know you're, you're you're at work but you're not really there and so I think once you get to that point where you feel like your heart is not really into into it, and you're just, and you can afford it financially, just to take that risk. And I think, um, you know, as Tal said, you can. There is a point where you sort of do have to make that risk. And I guess I've always been, in my family, I've always sort of loved gambling and have been uh, a friend. Like I love poker, and so <laughs> at some point, I was just like, I gotta go all in. You won't regret it. I think that's when I sort of resigned at work. My boss said to me, "You won't, you won't regret it." And the worst thing that can happen is you, you fail and, and you learn from it and you go. But I think the impetus was really, I just didn't feel fulfilled by the work that I was doing and it just needed a change as well. Well, that brings up a fun question. Tal or Anil, uh, do either of you have stories of, of failure that, that you can share? Um, you know, I think that being an entrepreneur, obviously you're taking a lot of risks and, uh, and you know, whether it's, Failure or pivoting or iterations or whatever you want to call it. Can you can you tell us about uh, about one time you you failed and what you learned and how that helped? So, uh, our biggest not failure but our biggest moment. So, au liberté, the name is a play on the word li liberty, which is a play on Liberia, where the rubber from our mm -hmm. shoes was originally supposed to come from. And liberté au Canada, au liberté. That's how you get the name. But. That money, when I sold MBAs Without Borders, it wasn't a lot, but I took all that money and I bought machinery out of Portugal, custom-made machinery, which was going to make the rubber soles for our shoes in Liberia. Liberia is where the shoe factories was originally going to start. To make a long story short, as short as I can, uh, my business partner in Liberia passed away in malaria about nine months into our company. Oh. And so that sucked, and uh, to put it mildly, and I went back to pay my condolences. I saw his wife, I saw their family. Obviously, see, see how they were doing, but our machinery was totally gone, totally stripped and stolen. We weren't going to ever see it again. It wasn't, it wasn't, I mean, it's a lot, but it was, about, it was all the money I had. It was about 40 grand at the time. So I was like, what am I going to do? And so I heard about in Ethiopia that there was this domestic manufacturing. Could we make shoes? And so I jumped over to Ethiopia, and I brought in a guy who worked for me in Colombia, and I said, hey, I can't go. My wife will kill me for six months, but I need, I'll pay you a little bit of money and go audit all these factories and tanneries and let's see if we can make shoes in Ethiopia. And so that moment, unfortunately, of Roger passing was one of the biggest turning points because that brought us, had to bring me into Ethiopia. And that's where now, you know, we worked with other factories and now we have our own factory and now we're growing that factory and we're buying new land and looks like we might open up a tannery one day. So that moment kind of was one, there's many, uh, many and many mistakes, but that conflicting moment could have, I mean, I had nothing, I had no money at that point, right? So I could have stopped or we could have kept going. So we kept going. Um, yeah, our team, um, this is with my time raiser hat on, we've always tried to be sort of early adopters in the technology space and just really trying to find technology that can enable our work. And in, uh, in doing so, we spent a lot of time um, back in 2007 scoping out what our new web platform was going to look like. We spent a lot of time investing in having it built. And uh, uh, again, this is just when YouTube was a couple years old and, and Facebook was just becoming popular. And we really had something that we thought was going to be cost effective, stand the test of time. We launched it to what we thought was going to be great fanfare. It worked really, really well. Um, but we missed a whole bunch of key signals in the marketplace. Like we, we weren't asking the right questions uh, there, which again sort of came back to bite me. We weren't reading some of the trends about what was happening in technology. And so in the, in the web space, for, for those of you who are familiar with this uh, area, things like APIs and SDKs started to become really, really popular and how tools could talk. And so we, we literally launched um, something to the market and within one month it almost became completely irrelevant. And um, we were reeling from the timing and, you know, again, not spending the time to really understand the space as well as we should. And so what that has forced our team to do more is now, for those of you who do things like SWOT analysis and PEST, and PEST in particular, just really understanding themes and trends and reading and talking to people and making sure that we're inputting things to, to really 
ha have lots of good information in front of us, you know, separate all of the noise, but that particular failure um, still stings our team to this day because we had to spend a lot of time um, unpacking the problems that we had just literally built ourselves into way back in 2007. But you were able to do it. We were able to do it, but it wasn't fun. Well, that's good to know. Uh, we have another audience question. Oh, hi. Hi, thank you. It's really informative and authentic, and I appreciate that. I know you've all touched on this, but it's something I'm really boggled with myself right now, is timing. And you said it takes longer than you expect. I remember going to PodCamp and hearing Mark Graham, who started Common Skew, and he said he thought it was going to take him three months to do this, and it's taken him three years. So for all of us that are now struggling to figure out, like, what would the timing be? Can you speak to that? And also, could you tell us a little bit about how big your team started with and how quickly that grew to the size of the team it is today? Um, I can start, I mean, because I sort of briefly touched on it. Um, so the first part is just, I mean, I guess it's been, you know, thinking about it over a, uh, a year now. Um, and I, I think with every, it depends on what you're doing, I think, I guess, is, is the right answer in terms of, you know, there's no, like, secret formula. Like, if you spend X months researching and then Y months, like, you know, networking or whatever, like, you'll end up with a business. Um, but I think it's, it's continuing, at least our strategy has been continually, you know, kind of, just putting something out there and trying and then just sort of being receptive to what the feedback is and then being able to see if we're on the right track or not. Um, th there's only two of us and there's still only two of us and we've only sort of had um, our website up for you know less than a year. So my answer is pretty easy. There's a six of us on the grant book team. There's six of us on the time raiser team. And on both sides, we've sort of just adopted this way of working. And it's life in perpetual beta. Everything is always changing. Everything is always evolving. Um, there's always sort of two versions of the same thing that we're working on. And we're always testing which of the two things that we're, we're trying to do, whether it's evaluation of our work or a tool that we're trying to use or the way that we talk about our programming. We're always testing. Something's going to be a little bit more sticky. We're going to go in that zig. We're going to go in that zag. So it, it, it really, timing, um, it's one of those um, sort of like Star Trek type of thing. We're in like this wormhole, <laughs> and we don't always know where we're going to pop out. Um, and, and, uh, but we've prepared ourselves for this like long journey that's going to have blind spots and alleys, and half of the work is preparing. If you hit that blind spot, the energy, because that's always the hard part, to sort of back out of where you just came from and then go in the other direction. And uh, so if that's at all helpful, these concepts like life from perpetual beta and uh, uh, um, ongoing journeys is just part of how we think about timing. Um, for me, it's patience. It's been the hardest thing that I've had to teach myself. I'm a type A personality. I love to get things done. I'm a multitasker. Staying focused, I mean, a lot of entrepreneurs uh, like to do, they get on the next idea and they start thinking about other things and staying focused and staying patient has been kind of the biggest challenge. And so, you know, my sales reps, you know, they want us to be doing five and 10 and 15 million already and we'll get there. But I'm, I don't want to be a company that's here today, gone tomorrow. Like we're trying to create jobs that I hope will, if, our, if the grandchildren of our factory workers today want to work in our factory, they will have a job. That's why I chose shoes and not technology. I love, used to love my Blackberry. I used to love, I love my iPhone. But it wasn't here 20 years ago, and it won't be here in 20 years. Shoes have always been around. They'll always be around. So I wanted to work and create an, an industry in an area that I thought could have long-lasting, sustainable jobs. My goal with Oliberté is to be the reason that a million jobs are created in sub-Saharan Africa. We won't employ a million people, but we want to be the catalyst for that. To do that, I need to get roughly, we've done the math, to $100 million in business. And that's going to take time. And so the answer is... It's however long you can wait. I have not taken a salary since day one. And I don't have money. I mean, now this last year actually is a little bit different. I got a little bit of, of capital through, through the raise we did. But I never took a dollar from day one. I preferred to get shares in the company because I believed in this. And we worked on, like I said, uh, my wife lets me be Peter Pan. And we got two kids. And luckily, for the first year of their life, milk is free. So you know, <laughs> you know, you know, you know, outside of that, you know, you, know, you struggle. You, you make ends meet. And you, you call, I call CRA at the end of every year. And I say, I know I owe you 20 grand. I don't have it. And they're pretty good about it. You can call CRA and be like, you owe us the money, but take 12 months to pay. And we're going to charge you 5% interest. They don't know I'm paying 42% interest on the other side. <laughs> so I got no problem with it. So you make it work. Because I've always believed 
It's the longer you stick around, the luckier you get. It's not luck. You don't have luck. It's the longer you stick around, eventually you will get lucky. Just keep sticking around. And it's like poker. The more money you can bring or the more time you can spend at the table, eventually you're gonna get the right hand that leads to another hand. And so that, to me, is really what, it's not, there's not time. Like I meet, other, I meet a lot of people that say you need five years or five million dollars, one or the other. But the people that I meet that got five million dollars, they're out of business tomorrow because they misspent that five million. The people that didn't have any money, somehow made it work, tend to stay around a little bit longer. It also depends on your industry and your patience. But remember, Colonel Sanders started KFC at 65. So for anyone who says it's only because you're young and you can do it, it's not really true. It's just a matter of perception and perspective. Trish, we have uh, one question by webcast. Oh, sure. I wonder about webcast participants. Um, he wants to get a sense of the revenue of each of the businesses, if that's something they're willing to talk about. Are you guys willing to, to share? I think, uh, I think we already saw, saw Anil's. <laughs> oh, no, sorry, that was profit, not revenue. Let's, let's, right. let's get into that. Why don't we start with you, Anil? Yeah, we're on a rolling 12 of uh, just over half a million dollars. And um, uh, we're sort of signing up more business every single month because um, we're building new tools and, again, sort of delivering on um, more of our, of our future products. So that's where we are now. And, um, yeah, we're, and we've only been around for like 18 months, so That's it's great. been a good run. Yeah, Gripbook has some, some really impressive, big, big and impressive customers in the philanthropic sector, sure. so congratulations on that. Tal? Yeah, I mean, I mentioned some of it. We'll do a little over $2 million this year. Uh, we'll do a little over 35,000 pairs, and uh, we have about 100, yeah, about 100, a little more than that, workers, and we'll probably have double that by the end of next year. So profitability for next year. It's, a, it's pretty good, but uh, we're still a little early to see how things shake out. And Amanda, is Be Meaningful pre-revenue, or have you, do you have customers in revenue at this stage? We are, um, we've gotten some paid posts, yeah. We, um, so it's $90, our business model is $90 for 30 days for posting. We're doing, to build awareness, we're doing a lot of free trials, but we also have, um, I think, five paid postings already, so we're excited about that. Getting some traction, that's great. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about talent and team and culture. Um, so Amanda, uh, I'll start with you, seeing as that this is the, the focus of Be Meaningful. Um, so what are some of the trends that you see in terms of uh, job seekers uh, looking for meaningful career opportunities? And do you think social ventures uh, are well positioned to attract top talent? Uh, yeah, so I think what we're seeing is career success today is no longer only defined by just how much money you make, but also sort of what impact you have. Um, it used to be, I think, that you had a job to make a living and then you donate money to sort of have an impact. And I don't think that's the case anymore. I think that you can have impact with your, with your work. And um, we're seeing that every day. Millennials in particular are really sort of keen to live and work their values. Um, there's a stat by Cohen just did a research study that 79% of millennials want to work for companies that care about how they impact society. And um, it's just growing more and more in terms of um, looking for jobs that allow them to do, um, have that sort of impact. So I think companies who sort of lead with their impact are definitely well positioned to attract sort of top talent in that, in that area. Um, Another trend that we're seeing is sort of companies sometimes aren't too good at sort of showcasing what that impact is. And so it's about sort of even in the job description, sort of being able to lead with that impact. And that's why on our new site, we're going to have a mandatory requirement where every job needs to have sort of a brief impact statement. It doesn't have to be sort of, you know, very verbose, just like a, you know, like a sample tweet, kind of like of what kind of impact are you working on so that to appeal to the job seeker's sense of meaning. One thing also that we're seeing though is a lot of the roles are more on the senior side, like it's interesting, like they're either like VP level or man CSR manager level, so it's sort of a little bit of a disconnect between, you know, the young sort of new grad with the desire to sort of make that change and also, um, what some of the available positions are, but it's exciting. Yeah. Thanks, Anil. Can you uh, can you talk a little bit about the the Grant Book team? Um, how you attract talent that uh, jives with your kind of motivation and mission, and also uh, a bit about how you 
um, sort of lay the groundwork to foster innovation within your own team? Yeah, we um, sort of don't really talk too much about, <clears throat> even though it's important, the skills that they have. So if someone knows HTML and CSS, <clears throat> excuse me, and knows a little bit about Salesforce.com or the Google Apps uh, ecosystem and knows how to do a little bit of Google script. What we really want to see proof of is someone has the ability to learn and be self-directed, but more importantly, can demonstrate how they can unlearn and retool. And uh, for us, if, uh, anyone who's familiar with uh, Kathy Davidson's work on Now You See It, uh, one of the foremost sort of educators in North America who just talks about um, all the ways that we sort of conceptualize reading, writing, and arithmetic as being the core fundamentals of early education, um, for better or worse, has to be added with this new level of just because the world is becoming so complex about how we all check our assumptions at the door, how we all process information, and how you really retool for when the occasion arises. And so the way that we build the team is everyone is curious and they sort of come in with, this is what I found today, here's a, here's a new way of doing something and I'm gonna stop doing things a certain way. And it's sort of that like um, self-directed self-discovery in around how you're always doing course corrections in your own work. And so that in itself really helped sort of attract our sort of first group of team members and um, uh, uh, just by way of small example, we've created a share jar in our uh, office. It's not too similar to the, the swearing jar that may some of you have grew up with back in the day. If you dropped an F-bomb, you'd have to put a loony or toony into the jar. So for us, the key habit is if you don't share well with your teammates, if you don't set them up for success, then, then, then you're, you're not building the type of team that we want. And so we just do some fun, playful ways to sort of make sure it's the right people that are on the bus. If you guys have familiar with Jim Collins' work, to really make sure it's attracting the right type of people who are there for the right reasons. It can, if, you know, work has to be fun, because if it's fun, people are willing to work hard. And if they're willing to work hard on things that can make a difference, to have the patience and the wherewithal to go through things that take a long time horizon is half the battle. So that's sort of how we sort of set the stage up for culture, team, and growth. And so you've identified, obviously, um, a really cool culture that you're, that you're fostering in your team. And, and it seems like you know, there's a lot of reasons why people would want to want to go there. Um, do people who come to work at Grant, Grant Book care that you're um, you know, trying to build a more effective and efficient uh, philanthropic system or is it really about just uh, just that attitude that you that you're um, fostering I think so because we lead with empathy when we hear people who are on the front line of doing things locally on food security or regionally on supporting youth who are trying to find their you know way in the world or we work with uh, environmental groups that are doing stuff nationally um, pe people really want to solve problems but stuff gets in the way the red tape and getting grants and uh, reporting back to, to funders. So there's all of this stuff that gets in the way of help get it, focusing people on the work that matters. So Grant Book has just taken the approach that we want to focus in on the unsexy stuff. And so when we talk about things like we want to quantify how many magical moments we're creating for the people that we work with, our, that, that reflects joy in the team. Like the team can see the sigh of relief on someone who's doing hard work, frontline, you know, getting paid poorly. But, but now their work becomes more enjoyable. And the more that we can sort of do that sort of stuff, and we, have, we actually have metrics on how many magical moments we're generating, um, that sort of helps us tie back to our social mission. So it becomes really real. It's all about leading with empathy, having good listening skills, and that makes the team excited. Great. Tal, uh, Tal what about Oliberté? Um, can you talk a bit about yeah, talent? Yeah, uh, the talent and culture is a little bit tricky, right? So in Ethiopia, where the crux of our staff is, I could tell them about fair trade and environmental matters and they don't give a shit. They just want to get paid and they want to get paid well. Uh, and that's not them being greedy. It's because they're sick and tired of not getting paid well and not having an opportunity to live on a living wage. And so the culture makes it tricky. Just because I want to pay our workers more doesn't mean I can. So just to give you an idea, the average worker in Ethiopia, there's no minimum wage, but it's banked on what the government wages are. It's about $30 a month. And someone says, okay, that's pretty low. How do you live off $30 a month? Well, it's a different economy. So you could buy also like a two bedroom home for $5,000 over a 25 year mortgage. So it's relative, but $30 is very low. We pay about on average $70 and some of our workers make a lot more. And so someone says, you only pay $70. How do they survive on $70? Well, we don't pay $70 technically. Sorry, officially we do. But Ethiopian culture, and generally in a lot of developing countries, in Eastern Africa, the Horn of Africa, it's a communal culture. You need each other. And so suddenly, if we're paying $200 on average to our worker, and that's upsetting the other factories, who sometimes we need leather from, or sometimes we need something, we're not going to have a friend when we need it. And so we pay a little bit above what everybody else does. 
but where we come in is with all the benefits. So we have a doctor on site, we have maternity leave, a little bit extended maternity leave, and the U our U.S. reps always joke that the healthcare we provide our workers is better than the reps in the U.S. get. <laughs> but that's that's their own issues. Um, so so, and we have all these other things. But then because we're fair trade certified, five percent of the cost of every shoe once it ships goes into a separate bank account that is controlled by the workers. And they decide how they split up that money. So if they want to split it up equally, go ahead and do it. Last year they bought bonds for the government bonds. Now they're looking at getting into a health insurance program in addition to what ours is. And that's how we're able to only pay 70, but in effect we're actually paying close to four to five times that amount. And it is actually extremely well considering I don't believe you're creating a new job if all you're doing is taking a job away from, some, from another factory. Right. And so our whole thing is hire people that don't have any experience at all because we have a strict rule of quality and timeliness, but create real new jobs. Don't take away jobs. And that's a very different thing when people say, I'm creating jobs, because all they're doing is taking the best and the brightest from somewhere else. And sure, maybe the other place is creating mm -hmm. new jobs, but that's not what you're doing. So that's in Ethiopia. But in Canada, that culture is a little bit different. Our, our staff here, we're not big. In head office, we have me. Uh, uh, wholesale, we have three, four marketing, and then our reps is 16, right? We have two, uh, one main sales manager, and then we have sub reps under them. That culture does care about our impact and why we're doing it. And that's why we're able to bring them on on salaries that are definitely sub market. But that's not an excuse of why we pay them what we pay. We just have to be smart with our money. But where we support them is, you know, one of our workers, she's a mom, she's a nine year old daughter. I don't care if she needs to go to take care of her daughter for the day. We, we don't really have vacation schedules. I don't care if my staff takes six months of the year or not. Maybe I do if they take six months of the year off. But if they take six weeks or seven weeks, I mean, Michelle's going to Italy in a couple weeks, I don't care. Do whatever you want. Don't tell me when you're in or out. Just get the job done. Have fun when you're at it and enjoy it. And I think that's what our workers love the most is that it's not a job. It's like I get to it when I get to it and I enjoy it. And we don't ask them to work late. We don't ask them to work weekends. We, we give them money randomly just so they can do certain things to help their own personal lifestyles, whatever that might be that they need. And that's how we're creating that culture, which is not about the Africa, the social responsibility. It's take care of yourself, and we'll, take, we'll do our best to take care of you. Great, thank you. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left. So if people do have questions, uh, I invite you to, to stand up to the mic so that, uh, so that I know and can call on you. But uh, what I did really want to do was give you guys the opportunity to ask some questions of each other. You're all. Uh, you know, working on some, some really, really interesting businesses, and we've had some rich conversation here today. So uh, why don't I start with Amanda, and, uh, and is there anything that, any particular questions you have of, of Tyler and Elle? Um, no, nothing particular other than we'd love to do a behind-the-scenes profile of both your companies, so. <laughs> um, as long go. as it's not over poker and you're <laughs> gonna take my $3, then I'm happy to <laughs> have that conversation. You can have my debt. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, no. Um, so it was hard to sort of publicly deny us that opportunity, so thank you for that. Um, <laughs> I guess, you know, what would be your biggest sort of, if you had to go um, tell yourself, like, when you first started, like, the lesson that you would write to yourself when you first started, what would it be? Like, something that you've learned. Tell myself? Like, you know, when you, something yeah. that you wish you knew when you began. Well, I knew this at the beginning, but especially with where I work, and it's a, I'm not trying to be a buzzkill, but it's stay alive, right? It's the longer I stay alive, the longer the business stays alive, the luckier I get. So I have everybody, I'm, I'm, more, I'm more, more dead than alive, right? So my investors have insurance on me, but my insurance doesn't cover me when I'm in Ethiopia. And that's where my factory is. So the joke is whenever I leave, it says, Tao, we love you, we believe in you, but if you're dying, you drag your ass across the border and you die in Kenya. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I taught myself day one is stay alive. And that'll actually come back to the question that I have for each of them, but that's, that's the biggest thing I can do is stay alive right now. Now we're at a point where we have other people, but that's the key that I have to do every day. Tal, uh, Nil, do you have an answer before we let Tal ask his burning question? You know, managing energy by far and away. It's been the hardest part, finding ways to know that it's actually not going to be four times as much time as you thought it was, it's going to be 10, and finding the energy to not self-destruct. So coping mechanisms, coping. advice for, uh, for the entrepreneurs in the audience? I have an office headband that I wear when I know things are going to get like I tough. I saw the picture of that. <laughs> yeah, you did, yeah. Well, right, yeah, no, so that's when, yeah. when things are, and, and it's the mental cue to 
this is going to be hard the same way for anyone who does any type of athletics that you just can't decide on a Wednesday that you're going to run a marathon on a, a Saturday. Um, that these aren't quick fixes to all of these big problems. They're long and they're hard and it's not one marathon, it's 10. And it's not 10 marathons in a row, it's backed with a, you know, one of those crazy uh, uh, amazing races, you know, <laughs> paired with a, a row across the Atlantic Ocean. So you just have to be like fully mentally prepared because it's hard, but worth it. All right, Tal, what, what, what do you have to ask of these guys? So it's a question I get asked, I still get asked today and even more so in the last three or four years and everyone asks, how do you know? Like, we're not successful yet. I don't consider us successful. We have revenue. I don't consider myself an entrepreneur because we're, we still haven't succeeded. We're still an experiment. But um, the number one question I get asked is, what happens if you get hit by a bus or if, in fact, you die in Ethiopia? And when we became, when I know, now I know we will be successful because if I do die, we won't be perfect, but there's enough people in place to make sure the company runs. And so that's my question is, if you died today, sorry. To, to kill you. No problem. <laughs> Maybe you can have my three dollars. Yeah. Will your company, can your camp company manage today? And if not, how long do you think it'll take before, and what do you think it'll take for your company to get to a point where it can manage without you? Well, again, in instituting the share jar, empowering everyone to have the access to information and tools to survive or to, to thrive in their role is by far and away the distributed leadership that uh, tried to develop over years. And then also, I'm only actually 10 weeks in to being at Grant Book full time and uh, uh, did the transition over a reasonable amount of time in December uh, where a colleague of mine has taken over as managing partner um, at, at Time Razor and we we're living all of those values too. So everything about distributed leadership, how do you build culture where people can, can do their own work. So if that proverbial bus does come, um, hopefully it's just the keystrokes, a few keystrokes away for someone to, uh, to pick up the pieces. Cool. Okay. Well, we're crossing our fingers. That doesn't happen. Yeah, Amanda. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Well, who knew this was going to be such a morbid... Um... <laughs> Things to well, but no, so, so, I'm going to break No, 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 but I, I, it's, a, it's a good... But it's a big thing. If you really want to get into business, that's what you need to ask, right? you got a family sure. and business to take care of. So something will happen, sickness or death. So are you ready? And you know, do you think about those things as an entrepreneur? And you really should. They're important. No, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. I um, haven't, to be honest, yeah, I've thought about it. Um, well, my business partner is in the audience, so... Um, Right now, I mean, I've only been full time. I quit my job like uh, just over two months ago. So probably, and a lot of it is coming from sort of my passion and going out and talking to people. So I'm not sure that the business could survive um, without sort of me doing that. Um, but I do think that, um, yeah, it's hard to say. I don't know that. I don't know what the right answer is in terms of how long it would take, but definitely, um, you know, a while. I, that's okay. <laughs> that's fair. Uh, Anil, do you mind if we go to oh, the no, audience? Oh no, please do. Yeah, please do. Uh, so I have a question to Anil. Uh, obviously, when you started a no non-profit and for-profit, the business model changed. But my question is around the culture. So, what was the biggest change in the culture of of the organizations that you founded connected to profit or not for profit? Um, the culture is actually, again, unified through this, uh, this larger notion of you get, if you get the right habits and work that takes a long time to see to completion, et cetera, we're really sort of, and I take it to extremes at time, um, this notion of share well and prosper borrowed from Mr. Spock's Live Long and Prosper, <laughs> and I actually I, I do have a crest on my jacket, which is in the back, and we have badges that go with how well team members share. And th the culture piece is just so critical, because again, if work can be fun, if people can be empowered to do their job, you, you wouldn't actually see too much distinction. Even though our business models at Time Razor, which is a registered charity, and Grant Book, which is a for-profit with B Corp status, the way we work and the way we share are actually quite similar, and we just get the simple things right. Empower your team members, make sure they have what they need, be respectful, be mindful. And uh, I, again, despite the way that uh, the, the, the nature of our work is quite different, the, the, the cultural pieces are exactly the same. Thank you. Another question there? Okay, good afternoon. Thank you. It was great to hear you. And uh, my question is we all agree that we should take advantage of all resources to make the business, I don't know, growing, robust. Imagine we are in a condition that 
I'm not talking about black code last night, just something that may happen. Internet all of a sudden gets crashed. And how you guys treat your business to make sure that this is robust enough. And then I'm going to take that lesson because I'm starting up. I know energy is but not anything about the internet. So. You know, from my side, shit happens. Right? It's going to happen. Something's going to happen. I mean, whether we sent 2,000 pairs from Ethiopia to Japan, order was paid for, almost paid for and done. For whatever reason, the rare day it decided to rain in the dry season in Ethiopia. It landed in Dubai. The humidity affected it. Long story short, it ends up in Japan. And my Japanese customer says, um, what's with all the rust all over your shoes? I go, what? All our stuff's made in Ethiopia, but our eyelets are actually, and some of the accessories are made at a premium supplier out of Italy. Italians are known for good quality. They gave us bad eyelets. And the rust, with the humidity in this, corroded all over all the shoes. What do you do? How do you protect it? You have insurance. It sucked, but that's how we did it, right? So our biggest thing that we... Because biz, your business will be interrupted. That's my best advice. Buy as much insurance for anything you think is an important part of your business so that you're, you're protected. So our factory is protected. I'm protected. Disasters, cargo. Insurance is expensive if you want it. But when something happens that's serious enough where insurance will cover it, that for me has been our saving grace. Thank you. All right, so, uh, so our timer here is telling us that we're exactly out of time, which means uh, um, we can all have time. a chance to network and chat one-on-one -on -one to, uh, to these guys um, and, learn, and learn a little bit more. So I just want to thank you all um, very thank much, Tal and Ilamanda, for, uh, for being here today. That was a really, really, really interesting conversation. So let's give these guys a round of hands. Thanks,